So hello again to everybody, um, Green Surveying International Fest 3. We're now well into the afternoon session. Um, last four presentations to come. The next one is to be given by Dustin Eno. We've got a little bit of uh, information about you, Dustin, that I managed to find on the website. Uh, Chief Operating Officer and Crisis Response Manager for Navigate Response. Dustin manages the media response for numerous shipping incidents and one of the company's lead media trainers. Uh, he has over 12 years of communications experience, including as the head of crisis communications for the largest wildfire management center in British Columbia, Canada. In this role, he managed media and social media relations for destructive wildfires and property uh, loss, routinely filling the information officer role in the incident command system. He specializes in crisis reputation management. And while at uh, London School of Economics, he developed computer models for tracking reputation in the online and print media. Um, Dustin's going to talk about the Wakashio disaster and how the crisis communications around that disaster could have been better handled. I'm sure you don't need me to tell you about uh, Wakashio. It's uh, one of the most high profile cases for, for some time. So without further ado, uh, over to you, Dustin. Thank you very much, and thank you to everyone who's joining. It's a it's a pleasure to speak with you today as part of your uh, your, your day long session. Um, I will uh, leave some time at the end for questions uh, and uh, very much welcome discussion. Obviously, these sorts of issues can sometimes be hot topics, so it's great to get a little bit of discussion. The Wakashio was one of the most high profile uh, oil spills of recent uh, a recent time in our industry. Whether it should have been or not is another question. It wasn't a particularly huge quantity of oil, and some would argue that in many aspects it was actually dealt with relatively okay. I'm not here to comment on the operational part of it. I want to make it completely clear that I was not on scene, I was not in Mauritius, and we were not contracted in any way to work on this case. So everything that I'm saying is as an outside observer, is as an outside expert who watched the media coverage unfold just as everyone else did, perhaps with a more analytical eye, but I was seeing the same information. When I first spoke about this uh, in an earlier forum uh, to a completely different audience, I was challenged by someone who said, well, you shouldn't be talking about this because you weren't there. And I understand that person's point. But the thing is, most people weren't there. 99.999% of people weren't there. Our industry and the response to Wakashio was judged based on what came out in the media and what came out in social media. And that was dramatic. That was very bad looking. And most people now have a dimmer view of the safety of the shipping industry than they had before this incident. And to me, that's the real tragedy. It's not about the specific incident as much as it is about the impact on the public perception of the maritime industry, which deserves more credit for its safety record, but often doesn't get it. Just before we get into the meat of it, I just want to give a little bit of background about who I am and who we are. I work with a company called Navigate Response. Navigate Response is a wholly owned subsidiary of Witt O'Brien's, which is perhaps best known in our industry as being one of the, or the leading American QI qualified individual provider. Navigate Response is there to assist with media and social media handling. We're not there to help clean up oil or to help to repair vessels or salvage wrecks. We are there purely to help with the communications side of the situation. Communications with all stakeholders involved. We often focus on the media and social media, and indeed in most cases that is the most important channel we use. But we also deal with politicians, with next of kin, with any other stakeholders that are involved in the situation, and to ensure that there is accurate, clear, and timely communications between the companies and the parties involved and the stakeholders who are impacted by any specific incident. In order to make sure that that happens well, we start with drills and exercises and training, and all of our clients who sign up with us have to complete drills and training with us in terms of media response because we don't find we're able to respond effectively if we've not worked together previously in those drills and training situations. 
We have a network of offices around the world, uh, as hopefully you can see the map on your screen at the minute. We're in 45 locations across 30 different countries to cover off all of the areas where there is potentially a hotspot. Now the keen eye here will know we're not in Mauritius, but we were in uh, South Africa and in France, two of the major media hubs that in many ways drove that story. Since Mauritius, well, they have very much their own media, a lot of the international coverage was not actually driven from Mauritius, but from other countries involved. Now, I want us to think here very analytically um, about how a story unfolds. I've put up on the screen here a graph that shows the first 60 days after an incident with three different types of incidents. A fire, an oil spill, perhaps much like we saw with the Waukesha, and a legal case. It could be a Marple case, which is often an oil spill of some kind, but where the focus, where the story isn't about the oil and the water washing ashore, but it's about the legal proceedings. And we often talk about the shape of a story. The shape of a story is how that coverage unfolds over time. So if we look at a fire, what you'll see is it spikes early. We get to 100% maximum daily coverage very, very early, usually on day one or two. And then it falls off quite quickly. And it's uncommon to see significant follow-up interest in a fire once that fire has been extinguished. Now, if the fire is associated with legal proceedings or associated with an oil spill, we can potentially see subsequent spikes, but otherwise we usually don't. A Marpole case generally gets almost no coverage, a legal case generally gets no coverage until that trial happens or until those indictments come down, until there are charges laid, and that's when we get that spike in coverage. Oil spills are one of the most challenging types of incidents to deal with, and that's the gray line on your screen there. They're challenging because they tend to be drawn out over time. They tend to have a slow start before they suddenly become a huge story. There can often be in a week or two before that happens. And they can catch communications teams unprepared if they're not used to seeing the shape of the story, if they're not used to knowing what to expect when we see these sorts of situations. So the Waukesha ran aground on the 25th of July of this year. Right away, within the first couple days, there was coverage of it. Some of you may remember seeing it. It was certainly all over the trade press and it was certainly on social media, but it never received wide attention. The average person in those first couple of days almost certainly had not heard of it. It was not on CNN or BBC. It was not where most people get their news from. The shape of the story was exactly what we would expect for a classic oil spill type incident. In fact, it took almost two weeks before the coverage really took off. You see those, the, the, that first period there, very, very low levels of coverage. And then with the first vertical red line there, you see is when the oil started leaking out of the vessel. And unsurprisingly, over the next two days, we got that dramatic spike in coverage so that we had well over 2,500 articles published on that day. Now, in the scheme of global stories, that's not massive. We've dealt with stories that have had 20 or 30,000 articles published. But when you're getting up towards 3,000, you can be fairly certain that most people who follow the media will scroll past a story mentioning this incident and showing a picture of it. So while most people may not recognize it, if you said, oh, have you heard about the Waukesha? Most people probably wouldn't have but most people will have actually seen some coverage of it. And if you show them the picture, they'll go, oh yes, I did see something about that. After the initial spill, the story started to die away as we would expect, and then the ship broke apart. And again, we see a spike, a spike associated with that breaking up. We see a little bit of an uptick when the vessel is scuttled, when the front part is taken off and, and, and sunk. We get a much, much bigger spike when the dead dolphins, and there was actually a couple different periods where uh, dead dolphins washed ashore. And I don't know whether it's been conclusively proven that that was associated with the spill or not, but that was certainly the conclusion that was drawn by most of the media and certainly the social media uh, community. It's worth noting here that uh, when the tugboat sank, uh, 
not directly working with the Waukeshia, but a tugboat that had been working with her. When she sunk, there was a small uptick in coverage, but far, far smaller than when the dead dolphins washed ashore. And this is something that I'm sure you've heard remarked on before, but it is troubling. The media cares more about dead dolphins than they do about three seafarers. Tragically, coverage related to human fatalities in our industry is generally less than it is for pollution. And that's, I think, wrong, um, but uh, it, is, it is a reality. And I think it comes back to the pictures, and I think it comes back to the dehumanized nature with which uh, people who work out remotely is often seen. People we know, we care about them when they die, but when someone in another country, when someone at sea dies, most people pay very little attention to that. We then saw a spike here with some protests, uh, and that's a really important development in the story. There was a lot of anger within Mauritius and still is a huge amount of anger within Mauritius in terms of how the government and the companies involved uh, and the other agencies uh, that, that, that became involved in the situation handled it. And there were enough so that we saw major protests in the street. Not something you see often with a maritime situation. So my thesis is that this situation was not well handled. We were always going to have a challenge. We were always going to see significant coverage. Anytime you have black oil in a turquoise lagoon, anytime you have dead wildlife, you're going to see coverage. But coverage doesn't have to be a bad thing. Coverage becomes a bad thing when that coverage isn't managed well, when the timings are wrong. And I wanna unpack some of the lessons that I think everyone in our industry should learn so that we do a better job next time and make sure that people understand that while accidents happen, there's much to be celebrated about the response and the safety of our industry. So one of the first questions you have to ask yourself when you're responding to any incident from a media standpoint is, are you going to be reactive? That is, don't say anything until a journalist asks you a question. Or are you going to be proactive? Are you going to send out a press release? Are you going to announce your own incident? Well, reasonably, most shipping companies, when they've had an incident, don't want to announce their own incident. No one wants to tell the world we've had a mistake. And that's understandable. And I'm not even going to suggest that that's wrong. It's about choosing the right strategy and being ready to adapt. So if you're reactive, and that is you are not actively distributing information, you are just waiting for journalists to phone you up and ask a question, you can avoid a lot of unnecessary attention. You reduce the amount of coverage, certainly in the first instance, that can change. And it's a lot less work for those involved. It's hugely tempting and it's not wrong. Roughly 80% of the cases that Navigate Response deals with each year, we deal with in a purely reactive fashion. It's fine if a journal, if it's a low profile story that has a limited impact on the local population, that's covered primarily by the shipping trade press, those journalists will come to us, they'll ask for comment and we can provide that comment at that point. And the reactive approach is right. A proactive approach is harder to convince people to start. It is more work and it involves telling the world that something bad has happened to you and to your company. But it really importantly, it establishes good relationships with the other stakeholders involved. It shows that your company is taking action. And remember, no matter how great you're doing at dealing with an incident, if people don't see that, if you're not communicating that, they're not going to know that that's happening. So you have to show action and have it be visible. It keeps the details correct. And there were a lot of incorrect reports that came out with the Waukeshia. We'll come to some of those. And it defines the narrative. Defines the narrative. That's a term that communications types like me like. It basically means deciding what the story is going to be. Is the story going to be about an incompetent company? Is the story going to be about the destruction of a beautiful island? Is the story going to be about the engineering challenges involved in, you know, recovering this vessel and refloating her and salvaging her? There are a lot of different narratives that can be applied to a single case. If you are proactive in responding to the media, in responding to a situation, you have the opportunity to define what story is used 
and how people understand what's happening. Regardless of whether you choose reactive or proactive, whenever a situation gets big, it is absolutely essential that you pivot to being proactive. Even if a reactive approach was right, you have to immediately, when you get a larger amount of attention, be ready to pivot and change to being proactive. And that didn't fully happen in this case. So remember that the incident happened on July 25th. The first post by the charters, uh, MOL, went up on their website on August 7th. That is a significant delay. Now again, they may have chosen to be reactive, but they needed to adapt that strategy sooner than they did because it was gathering steam before they chose to engage. This statement quotes from uh, the, the, the ship owner. The ship owner posted their own statement, which went up a day later uh, on August 8th. The statement was posted only in Japanese, but did include a automatic translation function to four different languages. But critically, it did not include a version in the language spoken by the local Mauritian people. It didn't need to even be a local dialect of French. It just needed to be in French, but it wasn't. From this, from, from this early misstep here, they took too long to communicate so that once they end, so that the, the narrative had already built that the companies were ignoring the island, the companies weren't doing enough. And then when they did communicate, they didn't communicate in a way that showed that they were focused on the local community. It didn't show that they were focused on that local population. The whole reason that we as Navigate Response have a global network is so that we can always bring to bear a local response when that's required. Because if people don't feel that they're being listened to, they tend to react far more negatively um, if it's coming from a foreign company than if they're being communicated with in their own local language. It's understandable. So what was the coverage? So a couple, you know, so on August 10th here, Mauritians use homemade barriers of straw, tights, and hair to try and stop the thousand ton tanker oil spill, destroying beaches, claims that the government ignored them two for two weeks. The companies ignored them. They were banned from cleaning up. These were the headlines. This is the Daily Mail here in the UK based on a report uh, from AFP, uh, which is one of the major news wires. These were the stories that went around the world. Again, presenting this image of a company that wasn't responding. And the image is fair because even if the company was responding, which I believe that they were, if it took them two weeks to tell anyone that they were responding, it's little wonder that people feel this way. Similar sort of coverage they're using, they're, you know, dramatic pictures. We see people in the oil, that idea of people cutting off their hair to build booms. Nothing is more desperate than the idea that I'm gonna cut off my hair to protect my, my home from the oil from this foreign vessel. That is a great story for generating public outrage and public anger, and is a story that should have been avoided by communicating more early. Now, I don't want to be too hard on the parties involved. The, the company involved here, uh, the ship owner in this case, they're a low profile company, but they decided they recognized eventually, I would argue too late, but they recognized eventually that they did need to grip the situation and they held a press conference. We're going to come on to that in a second. They also recognized that they needed to hire someone to deal with the situation outside of Japan and, and they did so. But I don't think that they did so early enough, nor do I think the companies involved were nearly active enough in gripping that situation once the coverage started to take off. Now, I've focused on the idea of the language. They didn't do it in the local language. They also didn't act like they should have to connect with the local population. This was a scene from the press conference. It's incredibly Japanese. There is absolutely nothing wrong with that. And for a Japanese audience, this was exactly right. If a Greek company or an English company or a German company had an incident in Japan, they would absolutely have to hold a press conference like this, where they bow, where they show apology, where they focus on remorse. But was this the right tone for the Mauritian people? 
the Mauritian people who have a very different culture and expect to see a very different response? I don't think so. And I think that this looked very distant, very odd, and again, not related to the people. People felt they weren't connected or weren't receiving the support they needed to from the companies involved. The uh, Japan International Cooperation Agency described it as a national embarrassment. Again, one of these things that you know, people in Japan are famous for, you know, that major apology, taking everything incredibly seriously. And I think that's commendable. But again, it wasn't really what the Mauritian people needed to hear. The Mauritian people needed to hear what was being done about it. They needed to see action. They needed to see people that they could relate to on the scene, or at least as close to the scene as was practical, not people bowing in a, in a, in a foreign way. And then we get to a particularly problematic misstep. And Again, I want to emphasize that mistakes will always happen in communication, and I'm not meaning to, to fault anyone that was involved. I was not involved. But we have here a clip from an article that was published by Reuters. Again, Reuters is one of these big influential news wires. They've just quoted the Prime Minister of, of Mauritius saying, the island nation must still prepare for a worst case scenario. The article focuses on just how bad it is, how this is potentially going to be devastating for the local economy. Someone for uh, the, the company involved apparently told Reuters that it doubted whether the incident would have a large enough impact on its earnings to warrant issuing a disclosure notice to investors. Now, understanding this from an investor relations standpoint, there are certain legal obligations where they would have had to disclose. And I think that's what they're commenting on here. The threshold was not reached for that disclosure. And that's true. But do the people of an island who feel that you've ignored them, feel that their livelihoods are at risk, really want to feel that you're really not going to be impacted? Regardless of whether this was true, it should never have been said to a journalist and it created significant and understandable anger. Now, the other thing that happened, and another thing I wanna focus on is the facts. Facts are complicated. We've seen in America the whole idea of fake news and true facts and all sorts of other nonsense. I'm not even talking about that level of debate over truth. I'm just talking about getting the facts of a situation right and being consistent with how they're communicated. If a journalist gets a fact wrong, in this case here, it was widely reported that the tanker, the vessel was a tanker. Tanker ship, MV Wakashio, a tanker leaking tons of oil. Now, we all know just from looking at those images and indeed from paying half a moment's attention, that this is not a tanker. She was indeed an unladen vessel. Tankers spilling oil are far scarier than dry bulk vessels spilling some fuel oil. But this is what the media reported. Now, is this the media's fault? Maybe. If we look at the statements you know, from the companies involved, it did clearly say that she was a bulk carrier, that she was you know, not a tanker. But these statements weren't being pushed out actively. Very little effort as far as I can see, and I cannot say for sure what happened behind the scenes, but in terms of what I could see, very little effort was taken to engage with the media, to communicate with the media, to talk about the facts. So, well, it's justifiable and understandable to say, why would the media call it a tanker? It's not a tanker. At the end of the day, I think it's our fault. Our fault as an industry and our fault as the company specifically involved in this case for not doing a better job of educating people who, let's face it, don't know our industry inside and out and will assume that any large vessel spilling oil is probably a tanker. So part of it was just being proactive, pushing that information out. But the other part of it was about coordinating that information. So why did the vessel run aground? 
why was the vessel close to shore? Early on, it was reported by some investigators that the vessel sailed near the island seeking Wi-Fi. Now, I'm going to assume they didn't mean Wi-Fi, they probably meant cellular connection because Wi-Fi doesn't go very far at all. So let's assume they actually meant cellular connection. So the investigators say this publicly. They announce this and it's widely reported in the media. The local police then turn around and having heard this, directly contradict that claim, saying, well, the vessel wouldn't have needed to come so close to shore to get a signal. So which is it? It's not actually the specifics here that are important. This was not a defining issue in terms of how people felt or how angry they were. The issue was the inconsistency. If one group that you're supposed to trust says one thing and another group that you're supposed to trust says another thing, then even when they do agree eventually, your trust in the experts, your trust in the people who are supposed to advise on how to clean up this oil, has been eroded. It's essential that the messaging be coordinated, even though that's incredibly challenging when there are many, many parties involved. And this was the classic case of a huge number of different groups, from the salvers to the scientific experts to the IMO, to Japan, to the local population, to environmental activists, to the government, to the opposition parties. There were a huge number of parties involved in this case. And coordinating all of those parties is always going to be incredibly difficult. And I don't mean to, you know, uh, underestimate that for a second. But it could have and should have been done better. Within the UK, we have a system uh, for dealing with incidents. Some of you may know it as the SAWS rep system. It means that one person is in charge and has ultimate authority for the response to a maritime incident. And that includes communicating about that incident. In the US, they have the incident command system. And indeed, in most parts of the world, there are systems in place for coordinating all of the parties involved. But these systems only work if people actually implement them. And again, I was not there but from what I could see as an outsider, the systems of coordination either weren't implemented or weren't implemented effectively. And that unfortunately eroded public trust in, the, in, the, in response because of the inconsistencies and the lack of coordination. Now, I wanna to turn to social media, which generally always gets a bit of a reaction. Some of you may have seen this video. This is a video, I'm gonna show a couple different clips from it. It was posted on Facebook and on YouTube by a gentleman named Nas Daily. Nas Daily has over 4 million social media followers and he releases a news video a day and a longer news video once a week. And this was one of the longer news videos that he, uh, that he produced. I'm gonna play this first clip and I'm gonna unpack a bunch of different aspects about it, but have a watch and think, what would you think if you were watching this and didn't know what you know about our industry? Guys, come, I wanna show you something. Three hours away from me, in that direction, there is a ship that broke and spilled oil in the ocean in Mauritius. Seven hours away from me in that direction, there is a port in Beirut that exploded, killing 150 people in one week. Two tragedies happened. There are many reasons for them, but today I want to focus on just one. Ships, they are more dangerous than we think. Ships, they are more dangerous than we think. Now, if you don't know anything about shipping and you've just seen this, that is an idea that you can focus on and you can understand. And given what he's just shown you, it probably makes some sense to you. One of the tricks to communications is having simple messages. Think about politicians who manage to mobilize large numbers of people. It's always an incredibly simple message. And NAS Daily has done a good job of this. 
and generated a huge amount of traction. Now, ships, they're more dangerous than we think. Now, he's going to need to explain that, and indeed he does, sort of. Let's listen to his explanation. Let me explain. In today's world, if I want to own a ship, the process is too easy. First, I buy the ship. It can be old, it can be used. Then, I start a shell company. I put the ship under my company and I register the company in a foreign country that I don't live in, like Panama. And just like that, my ship is legal. I can sail in the ocean, I can avoid taxes, I can ship anything I want. And if I don't care about safety and my ship crashes and destroys nature, it's not my responsibility. <laughs> it's the company's responsibility that I registered in Panama. So good luck trying to sue me. So if I understood that right, he's just said that it's Panama's fault, right? Panama, because they allow you to register your ship and register your company, has made it possible for an explosion in Beirut and the Waukesha to run aground. Hmm. Now, again, I trust that every one of you on this call who, who knows you know, a, a great deal about our industry will understand the many problems with this argument. But it's understandable why most of his audience didn't. Most of his audience will have come away from this video with a much more negative opinion of shipping, a belief that shipping is perhaps dodgy, interested in avoiding tax, and indeed interested only in money and doesn't care at all about safety. My experience of our industry, the vast majority of operators care very deeply about safety. But if we're not telling people, we don't have a counter narrative to this. Now, there was a counter narrative. The Panama flag did see this, unsurprisingly, I'm sure they saw it many times, and issued a response. But how did they respond? Well, I focused on the coverage here in Tradewinds, but it was picked up in other places. Panama flag slams evil video. The Panama registry actually described the video as evil. They called it slanderous, defamatory, disrespectful, and evil intentioned. Okay. Really? Was it actually evil intentioned? I think we can have some debate about it, but even if it was evil intentioned, it shows a total absence of knowledge about what the regulations are and what the worldwide shipping industry is. Again, if it shows a total absence of knowledge, whose fault is that? Is it there? Is it Nas Daly's fault? Or is it our fault as an industry for, again, perhaps not doing enough to have communicated earlier on? This video didn't come out till a month after the ship ran aground. There was time to have communicated far more effectively. I think it's worth also pointing out that the Panama Registry statement that ran to three pages saying, again, calling this video evil, waited until almost halfway through before they expressed any regret or any condolences or any concern or sympathy for those who were impacted by the spill. It sounds like I'm criticizing the Panama Registry and certainly if I had been involved I would have recommended doing it differently and adopting a different tone. But I think it's also worth drawing on the idea of who their audience is. When they issued that press release, when they issued that statement saying how evil this video was. Who were they speaking to? Panamanians? Shipping folk? People registering companies in Panama? I think it was the first three. I think it was all of those. I think they were trying to say, we are, you know, standing up, we're taking a strong stand, we are indignant about what has been said. And I think to certain audiences that played well. It stood up as someone standing up against Nas Daily, who doesn't know what he's talking about and is just out to make a, a, a nuisance of himself. But what's critically important here is that they did not effectively engage with anyone who is Nas Daily's audience. There was no attempt to educate, there was no attempt to communicate effectively about the fact that there are 
really good safety legislation that's part of flagging a vessel. There is guidance on this. There are processes. This could have been explained fairly easily, but again, it takes the time and it takes our industry being more willing to speak up. I want to focus on one, one, one final sort of twist in this. And again, this is just a, a good reminder that everyone is potentially impacted by a shipping incident, even if that company is not involved. So again, I'm imagining most of you have, have read Splash 24-7. They're uh, one, of the, one of the maritime publications. They ran an article about the Waukesha. It's not important what that article was about in this instance. It's the comment section that I want to focus on. Uh, someone going by the name Captain Manolis posted, I guess the captain of Waukesha will be in high risk of being lynched, but Bernard Schulte ship management will not lift a finger to help him. Where's the whole connection to Bernard Schulte ship management coming from? BSM is not involved at all in this incident. They have zero connection to this incident, but no one is there necessarily to correct Captain Manolis. Hans, someone else, who knows who he is, said, would you help someone who let you down? But that's not correcting the fact that Bernard Schulte ship management is in no way connected to this incident. He then, Captain Manolis posts again, I see BSM as cowardly rats hiding behind their captain. What must say about it? That they're not involved. Again, he has his facts wrong. So someone responds and says, look, Mr. Manolis, BSM has nothing to do with the vessel. You would think that at that point, Captain Manolis might go and check his facts. He might go and see if he is right. Instead, he comes back going, actually, the captain has been working for BSM for a quarter of a century. He made you rich. Again, it's not true. It's categorically untrue. But this is where all sorts of facts can start to spiral out of control. Now, I'm not remotely suggesting that there was anything that BSM should have done in this case. Indeed, there was nothing they should do in this case. But they suffered because the companies and the organizations who should have been doing something and more firmly gripping the story weren't. And therefore it was easier for misinformation to swirl around and for facts to become twisted or manipulated. So where does that leave coverage of our industry? Well, I don't know if you'll be surprised or not to learn that coverage of our industry, and by that I mean the number of articles that talk about the shipping and maritime industry is up roughly 30% in 2020 from 2019. That did come as a slight surprise to me. A surprise to me because 2020 has been a year of massive stories not directly related to maritime. COVID-19 being the most obvious, but the US presidential election, fires in Australia, and lots of other ones that we can all think of, it has been a year in which the media has been distracted. And we have seen the impact of that. We, of course, deal with incidents on behalf of our clients all the time. And we have seen that the number of media articles covering most incidents is actually down this year. But on the whole, coverage of our industry is up 30%. So why? Well, Part of it is the Waukesha. It was a big story. And as we started off by saying, it was one of the most high profile oil spills our industry has seen recently. The Beirut explosion also got tied to our industry. We can debate whether that was fair or not, but it did get tied to our industry and it was a big story. Those had an impact and those certainly did increase the number of articles talking about our industry this year. But I'm gonna actually suggest it's that third bullet I've got up on the screen here. And here is a ray of good news. The crew change crisis has drawn a huge amount of attention to our industry. Perhaps not as much as it should have, perhaps not as much as we would like, but it's drawn a huge amount of attention and most of it in a very positive way. You may remember at one point there was, you know, the clap for carers or clap for first responders. 
The maritime industry responded with uh, vessels in port uh, blowing their horns um, for, you know, to raise awareness. That got a huge amount of attention and widely positive attention. I think for the first time in many years, there's been a recognition of the value that seafarers and that our industry bring to the economy and the importance of the transportation that is provided. So there's some good news there, and that is the number one driver of that 30% increase in coverage. So I'm going to take that as one as a win amongst the other perhaps more negative uh, elements of it. Now, to wrap up, there were, in my opinion, some fairly significant media management errors that occurred. The companies involved, the governments involved, the agencies involved did not grip the story the way they should have and did not communicate as effectively as they could have. Again, I want to highlight that I'm not saying that anyone could have done it perfectly. There's sometimes said that no plan survives contact with the enemy and there's some truth to that. But I think there are some simple takeaways, six simple takeaways that could have made a big difference and that I hope will make a big difference in future situations. First of all, start communicating earlier. It doesn't mean you can't be reactive. As I said, 80% of the time we are reactive but switch over to being proactive far more quickly when it becomes clear that a story is building. Work on coordination. It's not always easy. It's never going to be perfect, but make sure that as much as possible, the organizations that are going to be communicating are talking to each other and are clearing the statements. I should see the statement that's going to come out from the Salvor, the statement that's gonna come out from the investigators, before it's released and they should see the statement that I'm going to release. It doesn't mean that we can veto it, but at least we know what the other parties are going to say. It's coordination. Show empathy that's targeted at the local community. Don't focus, don't be too uh, culturally centric. And I will be the first to say that the English, the North Americans can be incredibly culturally centric, far more than many others in many ways. And so I can, I'm not criticizing the Japanese in this case, but no matter where your incident happens, make sure you're communicating in a way that is empathic and relevant to that audience, not to your home audience. Correct blatant inaccuracies. You need to be monitoring what the media is saying, monitoring what social media is saying, and be able to step in and correct things when they get it wrong. Never make yourself a victim. Don't ever focus on yourself. It's always about the other people who've been impacted. And social media, one of the big, big challenges, but it can be engaged with more effectively, but we cannot call social media influencers evil intentioned. That is not going to be an effective way to engage with those social media audiences. So lessons that can be learned we're not going to get it perfect the next time, but I hope in future we can do a better job of engaging with our ultimate stakeholders, the general public. Thank you very much for your time and attention, and I would be delighted to answer any questions or discuss any points that uh, might be of interest. Thank you, Dustin. Wow, thought-provoking. Um... Really interesting, and I, I think it highlights lots of things. I mean, we're, we're all a little bit suspicious, I think, of social media. Uh, it can come back to, to um, bite you in the bum, to use that phrase, uh, unwittingly sometimes. Um, but what you showed there was a, a classic example of someone who just had wrong information. And uh, nobody seemed prepared instantly to check the facts and so on. Um, it, it, it's very difficult, social media, it really is. So talking about my own colleagues here, 10 of us in the office, I, I picked this up right at the start, pretty much as soon as the incident happened. None of my colleagues saw or heard about it until somebody said, have you seen there's some whales washing up dead and Mauritius and some dolphins? And I said, oh yes. Uh, I said, have you not been following the news? No, they said. So that again proves the point, doesn't it? That um, it's that emotive thing. Some animals are involved and uh, 
the story about the tug and the, and the guys buying on the tug very sad but that got very low profile by comparison mm -hmm. so I, I wholly endorse it um, ed just wants to pass on his thanks for a great presentation pleasure um, so you know that's good does anyone have any uh, further questions I'm astonished, actually, Dustin, to see that the uh, shipping news is a third up. I mean, that, that is extraordinary. It is. It is significant. Um, and uh, it'll be interesting to see what, where we go from here. Certainly, there has been a very slow upward trend over the last decade. Our industry has been getting a little bit more attention year by year, partly driven by issues related to climate change, uh, yeah. partly driven by the fact that I think our industry is slowly doing a better job of, of speaking out. There are companies who are willing to allow television crews to do documentaries on board, these sorts of things that help to raise the positive profile. And I would encourage more companies to do that. It will be interesting to see where we end up next year, whether we continue to see a rise or whether we see it taper back off to where it was in 2019. Yeah, I mean, fundamentally, uh, shipping is, is a dangerous business. You know, it carries inherent risks with it. Um, but it, again, I mean, I've watched uh, Mighty Ships. I'm sure you've seen that on the Discovery Channel or whatever. And, uh, you know, I mean, they, they handle some major cargoes. We, we had a presentation earlier about misdeclared cargoes, things traveling on ships that just shouldn't be there, and nobody knows what they are and so on. Um, that's not really the ship's, well, not the ship's problem. The ship doesn't know. Mm -hmm. uh, people further up the, the line who caused that situation. So I always think the, it's the reputational damage that I'm always bothered by with all of this. Um, and I think you're absolutely right to pick on the point that it's the wider uh, community, if you like, that gets tarred with the same brush. And um, unfortunately, we, <laughs> bad news sells newspapers, we used to say in the old days, and it was true. <laughs> absolutely. And bad news drives social media. Um, but the truth is, you can also drive social media with, with, with interest. Um, I think, you know, we were always going to get coverage of this, but we could have had more coverage on what was being done. There was a lot of cool engineering and salvage work and so on that journalists would have loved to cover. We could have easily had, you know, 10 minute television spots talking about the technologies and the processes and everything that was being done but someone had to make that happen. And sadly, in this case, and indeed in many cases, it's not unique to this case, that opportunity to talk about the great stuff that we're doing is lost and instead they focus on the tragedy of, you know, people ripping their hair out to make booms. And that's, of course, always gonna sell newspapers. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Dustin, fantastic. Thank you very much indeed. And thank you for giving up an hour of your time. And putting your presentation together really much appreciated and uh, i'm sure those who watch this on catch up will find it equally uh, fascinating as well so uh, many many thanks to you dustin an absolute pleasure it's been uh, it's been great to speak to all of you and i wish you the very best with the rest of your uh, day-long event